All right, next up. We have one of our signature pieces of content. It's called The Views of the Future. And it's a series that we're doing throughout the three days at the Future Forum. It's where we feature rising stars in Boston to share about what they're doing and the boundaries that they're pushing. And we are really lucky to have one of my favorite entrepreneurs here today, Natalia Bailey, who's the CEO and founder of ASEAN Systems. She's an Oregon native, actually, who moved to Cambridge to complete her doctorate in, the space, in space propulsion at MIT. So we're gonna claim her as a Bostonian. Uh, she's now married and just had a baby here. She's a totally amazing entrepreneur. And um, she helped to invent the first working prototype of the ion engine technology for small satellites. And that be became the first product of ASEAN, her company. She's won numerous awards, is a Forbes 30 under 30, Inc's uh, top entrepreneur, many different things. And she's going to come talk to us about space and the future of space exploration. So Natalia, come on up. Hey, good morning. Um, it's great to see people pouring in and setting up more chairs, and that's either for me or Michael Bloomberg, who's coming on right after me. It's unclear. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit more reading than I normally would, but I just had my first baby. Um, so if I didn't have this, then I would probably forget what to say. Um, but all right. So when some people think about space, they think about the Hubble telescope, um, and others think about traveling at warp speed to the alpha quadrant of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, I was a weird kid, and I thought a lot about aliens. Um, I grew up in Oregon, like Kathleen mentioned, and I would spend lots of nights um, lying on my trampoline, looking at the stars, and watching the International Space Station pass overhead. Um, and I would ponder this dilemma of, you know, the question of if there are that many stars, it's actually mathematically impossible to say with any amount of certainty that there could be no other intelligent life out there. And now I'm much older and more mature and less weird, and I think about aliens a little bit uh, less each week. Um, but now when I think about space and satellites, I think about the immense impact they have on our lives here on Earth. So you're all already aware that things like GPS and Sirius Radio and Dish TV and that awful airplane Wi-Fi all come from satellites already. Uh, but about 20 years ago, some researchers from Cal Poly realized that electronics had become so advanced and so small that they could pull bits out of a cell phone and put them in a satellite no bigger than a shoebox and launch that into space and have it do meaningful things like you know, tweet back at you on, on the earth and take images and send signals. So at a high level, this is you know, a huge revolution in space. This has essentially brought upon the, the democratization of space. So building a capable satellite of this size uh, costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars, whereas more traditionally, satellites have been the size of school buses and cost multiple billions of dollars. So you no longer have to be a, a wealthy nation to afford a space program. Uh, you could be a hobbyist in your garage or a high school student. So my, my day job is spent trying to solve this problem, where these smaller, more affordable satellites um, that you know are doing all of these wonderful things. They're, they're so small that they can't quite fit the typical engines on board that would allow them to maneuver and to stay in orbit. And so they end up turning into fiery balls of aluminum as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere a little prematurely. Uh, so I helped develop a technology at MIT um, to address this. Um, and I was actually there doing my graduate work because of the whole alien journey, um, and I wanted to work on ion engines, and the timing actually just happened to work out that while I was pursuing that path, um, the industry started trending towards these smaller and smaller satellites. So um, we spun out Axion, and I've been working on that for 
about the past five years. But what I really wanted to share in this views of the future session was what this democratization of space means for us and for the world. It has tremendous commercial potential from providing images and information about assets and commodities in real time, to counting cars in parking lots, to affordable, less crappy internet on flights. But I'm even more excited about using these satellites to make the world a fundamentally better place through networks of satellites that can, for example, better predict and respond to natural disasters, um, like this is a picture of a wildfire um, in Mexico, um, and those that will connect the entire globe to the internet, and to schools, and doctors, and to one another. And I have a, a favorite example. Uh, there was a mobile breast cancer clinic that would do exams um, in a little trailer, and they would uh, save the results on a USB drive, and every 90 days they would deliver that drive to a doctor's office, and the doctors would upload it and review the results. And they recently signed a contract um, with a satellite service provider to upload the results of exams in real time to doctor's offices, and 90 days, going from 90 to, to zero, can mean a lot for some later stage breast cancer patients. So now I'll take you another 10 to 15 or 100 years into the future um, when we're all living on Mars with Mark Wahlberg. Uh, so when I think a couple hundred years into the future, if humans are still around, it's probably because we have successfully moved off of this planet, um, whether it's to another one or the in-between spaces between planets and moons and things and onto um, space stations. So we're talking, you know, if you believe Elon Musk, um, which I tend to do, though granted I'm not on a waiting list for a Tesla or anything, but, um, you know, he's talking and, and the community's talking about 2025 for getting the first humans onto Mars. And this is a real, this is a serious, legitimate conversation and discussion we're having um, and we're all a part of it, and that blows my mind a little bit, but it's going to be one of the most exciting strides that we take as a species in our lifetimes. So I wanna leave, leave you all with some thoughts and, and an ask. Um, <laughs> you're probably wondering how you too can raise a weird kid that thinks about aliens. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Um, so I only got to where I am today with tremendous support from uh, many advisors and mentors, um, from my master's advisor who bought me 10 flights. I was at Duke, he bought me 10 flights up here to MIT and told me he would buy me as many more as it took until I decided I wanted to transfer here. Um, to my MIT advisor who let, let me take his place at conferences and. India and other incredible places where I got to brush shoulders with CEOs of big aerospace companies, and then my current advisors that keep me from making dumb decisions. Um, and I recognize how much I owe them, and I try to make it a point to pay it forward um, and do the same for the next generation. So one group I, I volunteer with um, in particular, I think, has a unique angle that I wanted to share with you. And, this picture is from each, uh, each year, one night, we take brand new uh, Wii's and Connects and MacBooks and we take them outside and smash them open on the sidewalk and take all the parts and rebuild new devices and prototypes with these kids. And overall, the mission of this group is of course to, to get more kids into STEM fields. But rather than focusing, for example, on specifically like girls who code, um, as, as one example. They really strive to have an equal number of boys and girls in each cohort. And the logic, um, the group is called Youth Cities, and the logic, according to Vicky, the founder, is that if we keep separating kids by gender or socioeconomic class or other hurtful boundaries, um, even when we're encouraging them to go into STEM, we're really just perpetuating those problems downstream. So these kids are going to hit the workforce and still not know how to work with one another and it's still going to, we're just kicking the can further down the road. So, you know, we've really got to envision the future we want to see for these kids and create environments and opportunities that actually look like that future. So that would be my ask, um, to do what you can for the next generation because it's your shoulders that they're going to need to stand on. 
And, you know, like the advice to dress for the job that you want, you know, let's create these opportunities that look like the future that we all hope to see one day. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of Hub Week, and thanks for having me. Thank you.